So we're looking at credit scores and auto insurance and home insurance, probably more auto than home. So really just finishing up this, the second part of the study. Um, so again, it's, it's frequency more than severity. It is important to note on the auto side, they're looking at auto liability. I don't know if they looked at auto property, you know, what that relationship be. Um, but when it comes to number of accidents, um, it goes up uh, related to credit scores. For homeowners, the department concluded that credit score was one of several important variables, not nearly as, as critical as it was with homeowners, but they couldn't get definitive conclusions on the ranking of variables, mainly because of the mold issue and some major hurricanes they had during that time. Um, and so they said a relatively small number of claims account for a large portion of the claim experience. Um, this is a concern because of the unusual circumstances because of mold. Um, when water damage and weather related claims were excluded, the average rankings placed credit scores as the most important variable followed by I mean, let read that the most important variable followed by territory. Obviously, territory is very, very important. Deductible and age of home. So it's it's critical once you take all that noise out, but then they had some concerns about that. All right, so this is this is pretty interesting here. How many variables are there? So there's essentially 3.6 million different ways to combine all of this. So you have territories times classes, times driving record, times credit scores, 10 different groups there, multi-cars, uh, policy groups, past claims history, types of vehicles, um, whether you new or renewal. When you combine all together, you get 3.6 million. I don't know how many people live in Texas probably 50 million or so. So it's it's possible one of those groups only has one or two people in it. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of ways they can classify. Are they in classify all of them? Only if it gives them information. So they, you say 3.6 million, but they would have to file every one of those 3.6 million with the state, um, or at least got to file all of these and then the combinations can combine for all that. So it can, they can cut and parse all this information in many different ways. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you'll know regression analysis. So some good basic statistics here. You have the dependent and the independent variable. So you can run regression analysis. Doesn't provide casual information. We already know that. All right, so how, many, how much of this do you all know? Generalized linear model using uh, that distribution, the actuaries, y'all use that? Don't they still, uh, y'all seen this, haven't y'all seen this? Um, <clears throat> it's a generalized linear model using gamma distribution. Have y'all heard that one? This distribution, um, this distribution implies that the expected number of claims is proportional to the length of a policy period and is commonly used in insurance to model number of claims for a period. Which distribution uses is really critical depending on what data source you're looking at. Uh, the st statistical modeling we did a lot of times, you know, you pick the normal curve because that's, that's pretty easy. Um, Sometimes you do like a fuzzy distribution, which says you just let the computer decide what fits best and you just give them all the control. But it's it's pretty important. You can see the distribution. What I think is important here is that the distribution implies certain relationships exist. So you're gonna make sure that's actually true for your, for your data. So what about R squared um, and some of these other things? So they, they said some statistics, um, indicated actual data were less dispersed than expected. The department did exploratory analysis to make adjustments in terms of the degree of statistical significance indicated um, to be understated. So they're getting some pushback. Gamma probability distribution, distribution commonly used to model the severity of insurance claims. I don't know why. 
The statistical model assumed that the average claim amount for a given policyholder is specified function of the rating variables for that policy. But this assumption statistics were calculated using SAS. Y'all know about SAS, don't y'all? Determine the parameters and the formula relating to rating variables to the expected claim severity. Y'all did chi squared, didn't you, in your, your stats class? So some stuff, you know, some, some basic statistics that you use, you could probably have used this as a case case study in your stacks class. Um, the R squared, they said R squared didn't really work in this case. Why? Because just kind of the data they're using. Um, but, you know, just test your uh, stacks class if you remember this stuff. Uh, these simulations illustrated a ver that very low R squared statistics typically resulted even if this regression model exactly mirrored the process used. The examples also illustrated that the regression models accurately measured the underlying variables and their impact even when the R squared was very low. So there's some statistic we love in finance that doesn't work in this particular case. Um, all right, so there's a study. The bottom line. Let me find the class notes because I, I want to go to this summary and I want to make sure. So is this on exam one or exam two? I can't remember. Y'all have the exam one rubric, don't you? I think I'll put that out there. I just can't remember. I'm getting all my classes mixed up. This is the fall 2021 semester, right? Or not? Am I off? So the capital asset pricing. Oh, and the mold. Okay, so the this exam is the cap M and the mold question, and then those two real simple math problems. So this is an exam two question. So you got some time to worry about it, but just making sure you got everything on it. You definitely want to define these these discriminations. They're important to understand when you're talking about what's legal and what's not legal in insurance. So make sure you have those. What was the purpose of the study? So there's two parts, so understand those, but it started off with the question of, is the relationship between credit scores and claims? And if there is, is it something illegal? Can the TIC, Texas Insurance Commissioner, can they actually shut it down? So if there's no relationship, they can shut it down because that becomes what kind of discrimination? If there's no relationship, that's unfair discrimination, they can shut it down. If there is a relationship, then they got to discover if it's just this proportionate impact, which all everything you use has some of that, or if it's, that's actually illegal. And so the department uses data to analyze whether the use of credit scores impacts certain class of individuals more than others, disproportionate impact, and predicts claims. And the answer was yes and yes. That was phase one. So it was a univariate analysis. They didn't consider other variables that might have been just as useful, could have substituted, that weren't quite so negative. Conclusion, credit score is co correlated to risk. Those two graphs I show, pages 19 and 20, are really good ones to put into your answer. Credit score has a stronger relationship to frequency than severity. Conclusion number two, there is disproportionate impact on race, income, and age. So then they go to phase two to do a multivariant analysis. The issue is not whether credit scores are related to claims, but rather credit scores as additional information over and above the other variables. The second phase study evaluates if and to what extent credit scores enable us, enables an insurer to more accurately predict losses. That is understanding something about frequency and or severity. Is there evidence that credit scoring was a coincidental, var coincidental variable that served as a surrogate, surrogate for something unlawful? Remember on that one, the question is, let's say you're looking at um, income. So as all credit score is doing is saying people with low incomes have low credit scores and they have a lot of accidents. If that's all it's doing, um, 
But if you could find people with low income who had good credit scores that drove well, and people with low incomes had bad credit scores, and they generally grew poorly, as long as it was consistent within there, income's not a substitute for credit for uh, for credit scores, and there's that relationship. So this surrogate for something sinister, that question had to be concluded as as no. So in conclusion, the use of credit scores is efficient. It does add value. And not only that, but it, it significantly improves pricing accuracy when combined with other rating variables and predicting risk. Insurers argue it helps availability, which is their way of saying um, there are people with good credit scores that this will help. They kind of ignore the fact there's people this will probably put out of the market. Um, this benefits consumers because insurance may become more available and may be particularly beneficial to more marginal applicants who might otherwise be denied <laughs> coverage. Um, but it may be available but unaffordable to those people with bad credit scores. From a societal standpoint, do you want statistically bad drivers not to be able to get a auto insurance? If we have some statistics that this person is on average a bad driver, is society better off that they can't afford insurance? Is, is society's goal then to provide good public transportation so that bad drivers don't actually need a car? You know, you can kind of debate that one. Some people argue this is piling on. People with bad credit scores, obviously they're struggling as it is. Why pile on? I gave them higher auto insurance on top of that. And then the false positives, we talked about that. Good drivers with bad credit scores. And that's where I asked about telematics, if maybe that could be some of the solution there. The uh, true positives, you know, you have bad drivers with bad credit scores. Do we, as a society, want to do whatever we can to get them on the road? I would argue no, but you might argue yes. Uh, I'll show you the uh, bad Canadian driver today and you can decide if she should be on the road or not. Um, the increase of credit information may have some unfavorable effects. Consumers don't like it because they question the relevance of it. Um, the issue of correlation versus causation is always an issue. Um, what could be the, the third variable? Could it be something that's illegal? And they've said, no, that's not the case. Is it responsibility, conscientiousness, but you can't really measure that? And do actuaries care? And from that standpoint, actuaries, if they find relationships, they're going to use them um, because it gives them a huge advantage. If you price people correctly, you'll end up charging less to good customers. And you'll get more of those, charging more to bad customers, which will run them off to other companies. I mean, it's, it's exactly what you want as an insurance company. Um, I keep using a surrogate for something sinister. So, you know, not saying you have to put that in your answer, but I, I really like that, that phrase. <clears throat> um, so I already talked about correlation and causation. You have to be careful of data mining. So the relationship could just be pure random noise. I don't think that's the case here. I think it's because there's some other variable that that uh, that explains them. Um, all right, you can read through some of these. Um, these other comments we talked through though those <clears throat> credit scores have a correlation to frequency and severity, but more to frequency. Does it have a disproportionate impact? Yes. Is it a surrogate for something sinister? No, because with any every group, the relationship still holds. High scores do better than low scores when it comes to driving. Um, do they provide significant additional predictive information? Yes, they absolutely do. What if one company says, you know what, we don't, we just don't like it. We're not going to do it. We're going to be the good company. We're going to charge everybody the same. Let's say they do this with single versus married drivers and they charge them all $500. And the evil company does analysis and discovered that married drivers should be charged 300 and single drivers should be charged 750. So these companies are out there. Good company is out there evil companies out there. So what happens? Where do all the single drivers go? 
can go to good company or evil company. You can go to good company, you're going to save uh, 33%. Where did the married people go? They're all going to go to the evil company. They're going to save quite a bit there. So what's going to happen over time? Well, the good company is going to be charging 500, but all their customers are going to be costing them how much? 750, because they don't have any married people. They only have single people. So they're going to have to raise their premiums, not the 750. They're going to raise them to 800 because they've lost so much money. They got to make it back up. What are the single people going to do now that they're being charged 800 at the good company? They're going to jump back to the evil company and get 750. What's going to happen to the good company over time? They're eventually going to go out of business. If it's material, now it's possible that they do five things, the other company does six things, and you know, they all kind of, you know, they do different things. But actuaries, this is what they do. They're watching each other like a hawk. They know what the other company is doing. Um, they'll notice that they're losing a good group of business, and they'll note it and notice it in their numbers because their frequency and severity will suddenly shoot up. Say, why are we losing good companies to this other company? So the only way you can not, you're not going to have a firm do this voluntarily. The only way you can do it is the state law has a change and says you can't price on this factor. Um, so it has to be forbidden by, by the law. What happens when you forbid it by law? Well, here's all states in California. So in California, you can't use credit scores. So what is California saying? We want people with good credit scores to pay much more for insurance than they should, and people with bad credit scores to pay much less for insurance. That's essentially what California said. Um, is that enough to get people to move out of California to another state? What would happen if it was really material? All the good credit score people left California, all the bad credit score people have stayed in California. Might not be the greatest person, place in the world to live, would it be over time? Probably isn't that material, but it's one factor among many others that people make decisions on. But you you know good credit score people in California are noticing their insurance rates are much higher than they can get elsewhere. Can you imagine someone moving from Texas to California and they say, wait, my insurance rates are what? Why are they so much higher? Well, because we don't discriminate on credit scores. Oh, great. Thank you. Makes me feel much better. Everybody gets a trophy. Uh, they're much happier paying the extra five hundred dollars because we're all treated the same. But I really am a better driver, and my credit score reflects it. So Cal uh, California sued Allstate. Allstate had to pay three million dollars to settle this. Um, it said the insurer used negative credit information as a reason to deny coverage to at least a thousand California car owners. They violated Proposition One Hundred Three. Um, essentially accusing them of redlining poor and minority motorists. The 1988 ballot initiative prohibits the use of credit histories as a factor in setting auto insurance rates. All states said they didn't break any of the laws. We'll see why they say that here later. Insurers clearing there is a connection between a person's credit history and a likelihood that he or she will file a claim. If they get that right, is it the likelihood they'll file the claim or the size of the claim? Is this frequency or severity here? That's frequency. What did the study say? Frequency. So they got that right. Um, is this correct? Do insurers claim this connection? Yes, they do. What else is true? Sure seems like that's correct. The data seems to support that. So it's not just them claiming it. You know, a lot of people read these articles and they say, this is just so insurance can charge us more. Well, it is also letting them do what? charge some people less. <laughs> so it's not like they're charging everybody more because of credit scores. They're charging some people less. John Garamandi Mandy was pretty well known there. Um, states started electing their insurance commissioners. How many people are going to run for state insurance commissioner on the platform? I want to increase your insurance rates. They're going to all run on what? Lower rates, lower rates, lower rates. So it becomes a much more consumerist type of uh, insurance commissioner. Um, contends that using credit scores to make decisions on insurance coverage is discriminatory, and that is absolutely true. <laughs> so is using age and gender and acts number of act. It's all discriminatory. So he's absolutely right. He says that is like that's something evil. I mean, you know, life insurance companies charge men more for life insurance than women, right? 
Do you know life insurance companies charge 70 year olds more for life insurance than 20 year olds? That's age discrimination. Isn't that illegal? You can't do that. So of course it's discriminatory. That's the whole nature of insurance. Um, what would insurance be like if you couldn't discriminate on any, anything? Everybody has to pay the exact, you can only have one auto insurance rate. Would the world be better or would it be worse? Kind of think through the consequences. It'd be great for bad drivers, horrible for good drivers. But yes, it is. I, I love it when politicians say the obvious. The company used a variety of methods. So let's see what they actually did, including checking credit scores and requiring down payments. So they're arguing this has nothing to do with using credit scores to rate their, their driving. We're rating their ability to pay their premium. And so we're going to say, hey, if you have a bad credit score, you got to pay us the entire year's premium up front. And it's a little tricky, mainly because you don't really owe the premium until you've driven. You know, you don't you don't have to pay your insurance premiums in advance. Uh, I'll say it is the fourth largest auto insurer, 9% of the market. Said it used credit scores to determine only down payment amounts and payment plans, not the rate or not rates or types of coverage. So they're saying we're within the law. Now, this guy says, I don't know who this Heller guy is. He's probably defined in here somewhere. Executive Director of Foundation for Taxpayer and Consumer Rights. You never know who these groups are. Uh, they, they always have a really great sounding name. Sometimes they're trial lawyers, sometimes they're the insurance companies, but they all have the word consumer in there. Uh, they're all trying to protect us. Heller said that using credit scores when selling insurance was a particularly insidious practice that made it hard for lower income motorists to obtain legally required auto insurance, even if they had no history of being risky drivers. He likened using credit scores to insurers practice of redlining on a map around poor community and refusing to sell insurance. And, he, and he's right. It does, it does hurt the most vulnerable. No question about that. It hasn't resolved the debate about using them when rating homeowners policies. All states said it would continue to press nationally for use of credit scoring for both auto and homeowners. Using credit scores increases the accuracy of risk evaluations. You know what word they're about to use, right? What word are they about to throw in here? What does the insurance industry always throw out? Do y'all see it? There's affordability, accuracy. Y'all see the A word in there? Availability. See how they, they always throw the word availability in there. They don't like the word affordability because that's not their job. Our insurance is affordable if you guys would stop having accidents. But we're just passing it. Whatever you do, we just pass it on to you. So affordability is like, that's not our problem. Controls the cost of insurance and helps us make insurance more widely available. That's always there. So, and I love her last name. Is that not a great last name? Wanna, how do you say it? Wanamaker? It's a great, great name. All right. Let's look at, I had an article in here on, uh, when well, it's in The Economist. Ah, I don't want to log in. I'm not show you all this. Um, there's probably better articles. I don't know any of y'all on your paper too have thought about telematics because it's, it's much more advanced than this article. I need to find a more recent article. Uh, AI has really changed this. Firms like uh, Root, that are, this has become central to them, have really changed this. I'll be curious. I haven't, I, you know, my phone keeps telling me I'm going to get a 30% discount, but I don't know 30% of what. So it may end up being like $3. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I've gotten really sick and tired of it because it can't tell when I'm in a car or when I'm on my bike. And I'm getting tired of having to tell because I'm on my bike every single day. I'm getting tired of telling, no, I wasn't driving. I wasn't driving. So I've just left it. Um, so it thinks I'm, you know, I'm driving 15 miles an hour all over the place. Uh, so that's a little irritating. I don't know how to correct that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this actually works out, which is one of the reasons I did it. I was just kind of curious to, to see. Um, all right. The other thing I want to look at is um, where we did that. Okay. This is a really, really great site. It's 
So if you're looking for a topic, article topic, it's a really a great site. I think I don't have a uh, TV. I don't think they do their dummy commercials anymore, do they? This used to be one of the po most popular. It's really, I thought it was a funny commercial. Maybe I remember those commercials. Y'all are too young to remember. But um, it's great commercials. Um, they had the test test dummies in the cars, and they were like real life people, but dummies, you know, talking about their job. And it's, I thought it was hilarious, but getting, you know, crashing every day. Um, so you can put your car in there. What do y'all own? Isn't there a smart car? What is Civic is pretty standard. A lot of people have Civics. So does this car look safe? So you can actually look at their goal, their key, and see how they did. I don't see where it is. Where is it? You would think front crash prevention would be pretty serious in that car, but well, we'll talk through this. Um, I mean, a big part of your protection is the hood of the car, but it's not the the length of the hood of the car. It's it's how much it gives away. You don't want it to be really solid because then the whole engine's up in your lap. You want it to crumble, right? So you want. So it's not necessarily just because this has a small hood. I would think that would make it more dangerous. But the key is it's how much it's going to crunch. You want it to crunch as much as possible before it gets to your feet. And that's how they're that's how they're testing it. Um, I'm going to show you some of their tests um, in here. Vehicle ratings. That's what I wanted. Let me try it again. I'm just not seeing the rating. Yeah, let me try another car. Ford Bronco. That sounds like a safe one. I don't know what year that is. There we go. I don't know why the other, maybe the smart car is just so dangerous. Um, that looks pretty good. Small overlap front driver's side, small overlap front passenger side, moderate overlap. They keep adding, you know, one thing they keep adding here is it used to be they start off having two cars just sit each other front on. They did test and they discovered it, it's very rare that two people just sit each other dead on like that. Usually you swerve, so it's more the side, right? You both hit kind of at an angle, and that changes the dynamics quite dramatically. And so they started doing that, and then people started getting hit in the side. And that's where we're going to talk about, you know, at the light, someone runs a red light, they don't hit you in the front, they hit you in the side. So that I don't know how many of y'all have uh, door airbags, you know, side air, airbags, that's becoming more, more common. But that's what this group do, does. They're just trying their best to figure out um, how to destroy these cars in different ways. And they're also looking at accident reports to try to figure out um, if they need to change how they're testing. So you can see it looks like it scores pretty well. I've got a uh, Toyota Prius Prime four-door hatchback Prime. Not that color, but kind of looks like that. A lot of green headlights. I'm not sure what that means. Latch ease of use. So what are they testing? So it looks like small overlap. I don't. I never have passengers, right? Because I don't have Part B and C of the uh, auto insurance, so I don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> I'm not sure what headlights are telling me. But you can get those scores. I don't know if I can find a car that's just. Y can y'all think of a car that's just really, really bad? I heard the um, swipe but or no, Volkswagen is pretty bad. Really? Volkswagen. I don't know how to spell Volkswagen. V O L K S W A G E. What's what's their Beetle two door? Yeah. When I was a kid, we had a Beetle. I love that thing. I spent most of my life in that little place in the back. That's probably not even legal anymore. Um, doesn't look doesn't look horrible. Now, who's known for um, really safe cars? Subaru. Not well. I was, uh, not I can't, I can't remember my car makes oh, yeah. anymore. Um, yeah. So there's oh, what's the name of the car dealer? 
It's a German. Huh? What's the name of it? Not Toyota. Uh, there's a car company that's famous for being really safe. I can't rename the car company. I don't think it's super rare. Um, but anyway, but you can put a new car in here. Now, you might say, I don't care that much about it. You should watch their videos and you'll suddenly care. <laughs> when they show you the crashed dummies and what their legs look like, what their chest looks like, what their arms look like. Um, yeah, they survived, <laughs> but their legs are so crushed that um, they're going to be in pain the rest of their life. Uh, I have, uh, one of my, my best friend passed away five years ago, a car accident. Mm -hmm. That kind of like opened my eyes to safety. And I didn't really, you don't really think about that kind of stuff, but you know, when you're in the highway or something. Oh yeah, when you're going that kind of speed, yeah. So. And I'm going to show you, you know, that people are much crazier drivers now than they, they have in the past because they're so distracted. Um, all right, I, I, I frustrated. I can't remember the name of that. Are you thinking of a Subaru? I'm not thinking Subaru, no. I'm thinking of something else, but I can't remember the name of it. Sorry, y'all keep saying Subaru. I mean, we can we can put a Subaru in there. I don't know what what they have. I can't tell that car from any other car though. I mean, a lot of green. I got one one here. Side test, original test that did well. I don't know why they updated it. They didn't do too well on the headlights either. So. But yeah. You just check out a Civic. I don't want to get a Civic. On the Civic? Yeah. Oops. I had one of those for a while. It didn't look like that. Well, oh. it didn't look like bad. A lot of green. Yeah, more green than my Toyota. I don't, I don't know what original versus updated. So that's kind of interesting to me. I don't know if they, they changed the test. They, I mean, one thing I think would be interesting. As a paper topic, I think one student did write this paper, is how has the IHS actually changed the way cars are designed and built? Um, you wouldn't think safety scores would be high on the consumer's list, but um, when cars score poorly here, they, it does change their engineers and how they design and how they, they, do, they do take this in consideration. They do want to have good scores. So, um, yeah. 2023 top safety pick. So it looks like if, if safety is what you're worried about, that's the thing to do it. Just don't get hit by the side. <laughs> um, they do have some, they used to have their videos online and they don't, they just don't do that. Or at least I can't find any more. Um, they have studies on airbags. So airbags, when do they come around? So what would be interesting is the paper is not how they just change cars, but what impact does it have, actually have? Can we do we know a noticeable reduction in the seriousness of our auto accidents because we're bringing in airbags? We know airbags probably save lives. They can also take lives. They have accidents. They blow up. They they have you know. So you have that other side to it. Um, they normally are hidden, but inflate. I mean, they inflate in a way that's quite scary. Um, they're required in all new passenger vehicles since 1999. Side airbags aren't specifically mandated, but nearly all manufacturers include them as standard equipment in order to meet federal side protection requirements. Front airbags reduce driver facilities and frontal crashes by 29%, and fatalities of, up, of front seat passengers by 32%. The driver has more going on with that big steering wheel sitting there, so it's much more dangerous to be the driver. Side airbags that protect the head reduce a car's driver's risk of death by 37%, uh, an SUV by 52%, so they're pretty material. Rear window cushion airbags are designed to protect people in the back seats or back end crashes. Far side airbags keep drivers and front seat passengers from hitting each other in a crash. Uh, I don't know what far side means, but inflatable safety belts are aimed at reducing rear seat belt chest injuries. So they keep experimenting over and over again. And you can see how they do it. They put all this paint on the dummy's face because they want to see the actual path of the head. Some of these videos, the head hits the air, the 
the airbag and then slides right into the windshield or into the dashboard and you're just like man you're thinking boy that could be my head it's pretty freaky and they have a lot of sensors so they have some sense of what's getting broken what kind of damage is there um child safety obviously that's been a big issue you have seen the pictures from back in the 50s and 60s what we used to do uh how material is that how important is that i mean the biggest issue there is people get the right seats but then don't install them correctly do any of y'all have kids or you have to worry about that I mean, isn't that a pain what does it take you like 45 minutes to get in the car it's with a one-year-old it's just like i'm like that's enough for me not to have kids i would just i would just get so sick and tired of doing that um <clears throat> Uh, distracted driving to me is, is obviously huge, and we're going to look at that. So cell phones and texting aren't the only thing that can distract a driver. Um, any activity that can divert, even your radio, you know, singing to the radio is distracting. Besides using gadgets, distractions include radio, eating, and drinking. I do that a lot, but um, reading, grooming, interacting with passengers, I've seen people shaving and putting on makeup while driving the crash rest of so these activities isn't well established because everybody's going to lie when they crash i was i had my hands um so yeah distracted driving now i did see one guy with a bumper sticker um you don't drink don't eat while you're driving unless you, you want me to drive in your in your dining room it's like that's a really stupid analogy because <laughs> When I'm eating, maybe it increases my chance of crashing what 0.1%. His driving in my dining room would be 100%. I mean, it, to me, he had his statistics off. So I don't know why some guy has a bumper sticker where he's mad that people are eating and driving. I guess he, he really doesn't like distracted properties. Um, and is it just hand handheld? Is hands free really that much less risky than handheld? Um, I did do a conference call hands free um it was a committee meeting so i was just listening and my uh, telematics gave me a point that for hands-free it didn't count off for it but they did say you were hands-free and like, okay you didn't count off for it but they're monitoring it that you're on the phone while you're driving i don't know how they knew it was hands-free i guess because it was sitting i don't know how what exactly they were measuring to say it was hands-free but it was interesting um but when people are talking on the phone, they really are, even on the it's hands-free, they're still pretty distracted. So even that. Um, cities have tried these laws against cell phone use. So the question is, is do they have any impact at all? Um, so I don't use my cell phone while driving. Um, like say that one time I had the committee meeting and I was just listening in, but yeah, I just turned my phone off. I just don't want it. I don't want that temptation at all. I mean, it's tempting. You hear the little beep. Someone sent you a text or something. But you know, 40 years ago, we just didn't know. <laughs> no one could get a hold of us. So I don't know who these people are that you know they don't get back to you in two seconds. Your world's going to come to an end. But you know, uh, but that's a pretty big deal. And they, a lot of good statistics. You can almost write your entire paper just from their website. So here's the cell phone laws. So Texas drivers in school crossing zones and on public school property during the time of the reduced speed. So you've seen those signs. California, all drivers, all drivers. So a lot of states have a complete ban. Texting is banned and all drive for all drivers in 48 states. What is Missouri? Oh, only for drivers 21 and younger. They're probably better at it than their 60 year old <laughs> parents and grandparents. So yeah, Montana, no ban. What's but what are you gonna do? Hit a cow every once in a while. Like, there's not many people there, so you'll probably be okay. Um, so see, just great, great, great information here on all kinds of things. Um, so distracted drivers um headlights how important are those large trucks motorcycles older drivers um be interested to see where's there bicycles there's my thing red light running i do want to talk about that roundabouts so there's you can almost see an entire paper on roundabouts and how much they don't reduce frequency they reduce severity 
but dramatically to reduce. Um, in fact, there's YouTube, entire YouTube, like hour long videos on roundabouts and their impact. Seatbelts, there's where, um, you know, the famous, uh, I see if his name's even in here. Yeah. So seatbelt laws came in, um, I think 50s and 60s. I forget the guy's name. Well, I'm forgetting so many, so many names. Um, he ran for president, probably law school or the election, but I can't remember his name. Um, but he's the one that pushed for seatbelts, probably, I think, back in the 60s. Um, so there's there's some concern with seatbelts. Um, there's been studies that shown when you have safety things like that, that people actually drive more dangerously because they have the seatbelt. And so it might reduce severity for some people, but might actually increase it for some people. But this says lap and shoulder seat belt reduces risk of fatal injury by 60% in an SUV and 45% in a car. So they have statistics to show that. I don't know how they have the statistics to show that now, given that everybody has to wear a seat belt, unless they're just watching people, you know, people who don't reach wear seat belts might be dangerous for other reasons as well. So it might not be the seat belts. So again, and they, you have to worry about that causal relationship. Um, Speed, obviously, teenagers, vehicle size and weight. There's all kinds, there's all kinds of studies that they do that are very, very interesting. Most minivan seatbelt, what reminders fall short. Crash avoidance features complicate repairs. Automation issues are bigger than Tesla. And you know, obviously Tesla's gotten some bad press here recently. So there's a lot. They have a whole section on just explore more. That looks like the same thing we had before. What did y'all think the first roundabout you came to? Was it kind of intimidating and frustrating? Like, what am I supposed to do here? Or did you go, I know this makes perfect sense. I saw a video of a police officer pull this guy over his our right because the guy was in the circle and the police officer says, no, you're supposed to, you're supposed to yield to the person coming in. And the guy was like, I don't think you're right. And the guy kept lecturing, you know, you don't, I'm the policeman here. I know the law. You're supposed to yield to me. I was, I was like, yeah, you need to go back and read, read, read the rules again. Um, so why are roundabouts so effective? We'll, we'll see a video on this. They look more confusing, but you notice going into the roundabout, you have, you almost have no choice but to slow down. And that's the big advantage for them and red lights. People can come with the red lights 70 miles an hour and just keep flying right on through. You can't do that with a roundabout. So you might have some more accidents, but they tend to be just bumper scrapers, kind of really minor, minor things. Have any of y'all had an issue with a roundabout? Someone didn't know what they were doing? I tell you what, in Costa Rica, they're they're fun. People are going around those things like 60 miles an hour and it's bumper to bumper and you just like, you just go and you hope they stop for you because it's it's just crazy, crazy, crazy. I, I guess they're safe in there too, but people just, there's, there's, there's no consideration. They'll stop if you go in because they don't want to be hit, but they sure don't give you any indication they're going to stop at all. Uh, so a lot, lot to do. We're going to watch a few other videos, um, maybe not tonight, but a few other videos. Uh, I do want to watch one video now. I think the sound is working, but we'll see. So what I want you to do here is a, a few a few places when we drive that I think are particularly dangerous for us. And I think if we pay attention to, to these, you can actually reduce your probability of a crash by a very, very high amount. Because crashes don't happen just randomly all over the place. They, they're concentrated in just a few places and a few type of events. So. Yeah, it doesn't sound like I have sound, does it? Help me to escape. Of course, Zoom comes back. Maybe this doesn't have sound. We'll see. Okay, well, we don't really need sound until the very end, so we'll see. All right, so first of all, we're coming to a light. All right, I just want to encourage you, anytime you come to the light, you should be ultra, just observing everything, okay? 
Don't ever drive as I've got them right away. That's never a smart way to try. And there you have it. How could they not see them? Because that, that happens all the time. People are just not paying attention. So is it entirely this person's fault? Well, you say, yeah, but this the guy coming in should have realized he's coming into an intersection. Not a serious accident, but it certainly could have been. Oh, there's the sound. Another light. You can see it already happening. What is his light? Red. Now, when should this guy have the look at the crossing traffic? So he's sitting there. I, I'm I always just look left and right now. Uh, it's a little dangerous because the person behind me, they may start to go. So I start looking, you know, well in advance. Because this is really, I think this really is maybe the most dangerous thing we do is driving is crossing the light here, especially if it's a highway or the speed limits. Uh, now, was he running the red light or just wasn't painting? He just had no clue there's a red light there. It looks like it had been red for quite some time. So he may not have even been noticing. It was kind of bright, so it was hard to see the lights, but that could have been a pretty dangerous, pretty serious. So it looks like no one was injured. And this guy, you know, I like how that guy just in the orange truck says, okay, well, that hurt me. There's another light. Sorry if there's any cuss words in there. She's got the yellow light, but again, she probably could have avoided it if she'd been looking that direction. Oh, another light. You all notice it? So this is the one I was talking about before. This guy's going to let the person in, but there's two lanes, and this person is totally oblivious. I think this person's somewhat at risk. I mean, at, at, at fault. When you come to a light and this person's sitting there, I think you've always got to slow down and assume someone's turning. I think always. And people will take that lane in just 45, 50 miles an hour. When you come to a light and there's another lane and people are sitting there, I just I think it's incredibly dangerous. In a situation like that, why is the person who is recording something they have the green light? Are they trying to yeah? I don't know if they're letting them in or what. That's that's a good question. Yeah, it's confusing to this person. Um, you know, what if you're this person? You know, you should know, boy, it's I got another lane over here. Um, yeah, so I don't yeah, I don't I don't know the logic there. Maybe he's turning left. Another light. Well, it's almost like he was slowing down so he could get hit. I don't know why exactly he's doing that. All right, so here's the roundabout. You can see an accident, but you'll notice it's not very serious. Why? Because this guy's not going very fast, and this guy's going in a circle. He can't go very fast. So, yeah, there's an accident, but it's pretty minor. No one was injured. The car probably wasn't that damaged. But, yeah, you can have an accident in a roundabout. Certainly, certainly quite possible. All right, this is something I've done. Probably everybody in this room is going to do this at least once, but you're yielding. There's a car in front of you. What should you be doing? You should be staring at the car in front of you, right? Don't even look because our mind, we're start, we start focusing on like traffic coming and we, we kind of forget there's a car in front of us. This guy should just be looking straight in front of him. Oh, it's clear. Oh, that happens all the time. It's usually not that serious, right? Because it's coming from a side. Now, you ask, why did this person stop? I don't know, but people do that. There are some timid drivers out there, and you just need to stare right in front of you. <laughs> he probably said, oh, oh, no. Doesn't look like much damage, though, does it? Probably $7,000 in damage. Doesn't look too bad. Feels great. All right, so here's the turning one. Open lane. This guy's slowing down. Well, you, you can just see this one coming. Who's at fault there? 
Well, <laughs> well, I don't know what's in front of them. It's hard to tell. I mean, when you go to driver's safety, which you know the rules of the road, it's that part. So it's the Mitsubishi is first. Oh. Then it's the person whoever is should be turning out and going like right. And then it's going to be the person in the middle that turns. I mean, all three of all three of them contributed to this. This guy was yeah. going too fast, right? No, that car was definitely it seemed to be. Oh my word! It was, looked like he he kept going there just to say, "Hey y'all," and this guy turns right and says, it's "Not my problem." Here's another one: open lane. So, so there again, open lane. You're flying down. It's so common when you have that kind of thing. They're going to let someone out. Sure. And, that uh, kind of scares people. Like there's a bus right there where you you know you can't see that person right. turning to you can't see. And yeah, you just that's... slow down and hope the guy behind you doesn't. All right, so here's some of the uh, worst drivers in Canada. All right, these people are on the road. You should watch this program, and if you have teenage drivers, sometime you should have them watch it and see what their reaction is. And as they're saying, well, I don't see any problem with that. Then. All right, so this is, I think, the worst driver in Canada. She beat up this guy from the last program. Now, I don't know about these programs. Do you think they're egging these people on to have a good program? Is she really as horrible as this program makes her seem? Yeah. Let's see if you would rather. Now she's all in tears now because they don't like her. She must be doing well if she can afford $10,000 for auto insurance. I don't know what she does for a living. It could be a lot worse only that since she's having it. This is brother Steven. All right, so that's a pretty good brother, isn't it? They couldn't get the cameraman the ride, so he's going to get in the car with them. I think he's crazy. You're going to see in a minute. I'm worried he's going to be killed on the road. She doesn't understand the, the consequences of her actions. Before she leaves, And minutes of the drive from 70 to 40 zone. Here. Now, now, this is Canada. So 70 is not as bad as it sounds. All right. 70 kilometers per hour is only like 40, 45 miles an hour. So it's not as bad as it sounds. <clears throat> well, what is she that she's supposed to be going? 40. So, 40 yeah, it's, it is like 40. she's going, you know, well over. She drives on a sidewalk. Okay, I'll get When would you have gotten out of the car? You're her brother. Word. He yeah. puts Paul Chris, the most dangerous nominee we've ever had. Maybe dead. Right. Crystal. That meant it by driving me. It's this. Every time Crystal starts moving from a stationary position, she literally lowers the gas pedal and keeps it for until she releases it to the She never maintains the speed. Uh-huh. How clear. She wants to be in a 60 zone. She wants your speed air phone. She gets to the beach zone. Things get scary. Very soon.
Now, do you think there are people like that texting? Do y'all know people that text like this? Would you get in a car with someone that texts like that all the time? Would you tell someone from how much guts do you have? Do you have a family member that texts all the time? You say, I'm not riding with you anymore. Um, yeah. Texting while driving, I think, is pretty be insane. Now, 150 is pretty fast. <laughs> that's like close to 100 miles an hour. So that's that's pretty fast. Oh, let's just see if I'm up here. I right, see so he was crying before, now it's just a joke. Or is it like, what's this? This is pretty crazy. No, he's back to the stop sign. Oh, there he is. See why I think you should be careful coming to a light. Crystal's out there. So anyway, that's that's what's out there. Now that's in Canada, so you don't have to worry. I've seen people like this in these states. Um, I remember once I was turning left and this person cuts in front of me. There's two left turn lanes. He cuts in front of me, cuts me off, gets on the left side, and we're turning left. So we turn left. She then cuts in front of me again, slams on the brakes, and turns into a, a eatery right there. And it was like, and everybody's honking at her. It's like, well, you have kids in the car. I hope they, they make it. I hope you get a nice sandwich. So, so these people exist. But, you know, your goal is to survive. It's not to prove that they're bad drivers. So to me, it's like, let them have it, whatever it takes. But, uh, you know, road rage is a big issue. But um, while we when we drive, we're, we're definitely doing um, some pretty... Pretty dangerous stuff, mainly because there's other people out there on the road that you have to just watch out for. So, um, do, do any of y'all have dash cams? Are y'all starting to do that? Um, I've thought about getting some, but boy, they're, they're expensive and the cheap ones aren't very good and the expensive ones are really, really expensive. But I'm glad people do because I, I watch those videos. Um, these videos here, I watch them all the time. They're, I find them really, to me, fascinating just to see what is, you know, I've been almost mentally keeping a list of what is the situation and just red light, red light, red light comes up, you know, 70, 80% of the time. There are some, I don't know how people are just driving too fast in and, and wet, wet roads and those you can just see them coming. So speed, speed and red lights. And then when you combine speed with red lights, Someone's gonna someone's gonna die. It's just almost inevitable. All right. Not to make y'all nervous driving home tonight. <laughs> San Antonio is a little bit different. We're pretty sleepy, slow cities. So uh, if you've been to Austin or Houston, I mean it's it, there's it's a different level of, of danger in those cities. Um, all right. Another issue I want to talk about with auto insurance, which could definitely be a um a paper two and it's been a pretty popular one is autonomous cars so tesla's going through this now i don't know if any of y'all have teslas and what it feels like to be in a tesla when it's doing the driving for you um and where this is going so these these are articles from a few years ago where they were really predicting 
by 2020, we're going to see driverless cars everywhere. So it looks like it's slowed down. So the question is, did we overhype it and it's going to completely go away? So I think when you see this, uh, there's something called the S curve. I don't know if y'all have seen the S curve before, but the S curve is new technology. And what usually happens is it gets hyped early, seems like it disappears, and then all of a sudden it's back. So I think AI kind of feels like that now. AI was really hyped, then it like disappeared, and then suddenly, in just last what last month, I don't know, just recently, suddenly AI is back in the news and it's taking over everything. It's destroying colleges. It's whatever. Um, I think autonomous vehicles might be that way, mainly because of the people pushing this. This isn't the auto insurance. I mean, the auto industry pushing this. It's it's Apple. It's Google. It's Alpha, Alphabet. Alphabet. Google. Um, Amazon, it's people who don't want us driving because that's when we're not shopping. We're not on their systems. We're not using their apps. So they want us out of the car. They want us using their apps. And those are pretty wealthy firms. You know, Alphabet by itself is spending billions of dollars on this uh, to try to get it there. But it's not just on the auto side, autonomous trucks, delivery trucks, those kind of things. That's where we have the shortage of workers. And so there was definitely a strong incentive to get this to work. There early on, there was a lot of debate about what this means for the insurance industry. So I've had a student try to do an article on electronic vehicles in the auto insurance industry. I don't think that really works. I don't think electric vehicles are gonna be that big of an impact on in the insurance industry. But this is one that will. So there's there's a couple ways this might change it. First is fully autonomous. The other is partial autonomous. And then the last would be car takes over an emergency kind of thing. I, I, obviously, I can't spin up, spell autonomous. I don't know where I've got it wrong. So fully autonomous, we get in the car and it does everything. So this is gonna cause a redesign of the car. There's no reason for the car to face forward. And we all just look, we'll probably look more like a dining room with a table and Wi-Fi. and we get in the car and we just, you know, playing games, watching TV, whatever. Um, partial autonomous, the car does certain things, we do certain things. So the car probably looks about the same. What does the car take over? I think autonomous cars could probably get you from um, outside of San Antonio to El Paso without too much trouble going down I-10 with that. And, and I think they could redesign highways too to put things along the highway to make the autonomous car much easier to, to, to work with. So I think there are places definitely, the in-city driving, that's a little bit questionable, but there are people thinking about that. And then here I've already, you know, it was shocking to me getting my last car when my car does take over certain things. Um, the, the first thing I noticed was the uh, the um, putting cruise control on. I didn't know my car was going to adjust speed automatically. You know, I'm so used, I was so used to turning cruise control off because this, the traffic was slowing down. And now it's like, why even bother? My car is going to slow down. I think that's kind of dangerous, actually. <laughs> So like my car, I mean, I'm going 60 to slow down to 50 if traffic starts slowing down. It makes one thing I've noticed that I've stopped doing that is I discovered is really dangerous is what I'm doing with my feet. Because if I do need to move my feet, it's like caught underneath the brake. And I'm like, oh, wait. And I got my shoe off, stretching or whatever. And I was like, I'm not prepared. So I don't do that anymore. But it, you do get kind of complacent when the car starts. And so it's kind of back to that seatbelt thing. You have these things to make the car safer, it makes us less we're not paying attention, so it makes us actually more dangerous. This first one is probably, I think, destroys the auto insurance industry. And the reason I say this is we stopped buying cars. If if I can put an app on my phone and a driverless car shows up, picks me up, takes me right to the doorstep of where I'm going, picks me up, brings me home, I don't need a garage, I don't need a parking spot, uh, I don't need auto insurance. I don't need oil changes. As long as it's reliable, 
I could certainly do that. Why would it be reliable? Well, this article will show you why it's reliable. It really comes down to uh, usage. Car set idle, I think it's in this, I think it's in here. So why is, why is usage so much better? Autonomous vehicles will also challenge the very notion of auto, auto car ownership. Cars among the most expensive thing we own, and yet they sit idle 96% of the time. And just think about that. We got this asset that's just sitting there that if we go to an app where cars shows up, cars are going to be used much more frequently. Now, obviously, there's times during the day uh, where, you know, you, Usage is going to be much more concentrated, but even then it might redesign when we show up to work and those kind of things. It also changes work itself, whereas it was really interesting during COVID. The initial studies said workers were more productive, but then they started discovering it wasn't that workers were more productive. What workers were doing was they were donating their commute time to their companies. So all that time they're sitting in the car, now their company's getting that for free. And essentially that's what autonomous vehicles do. We can still drive to work, but we're working on the way. So rather than driving to work at seven o'clock to get there by eight, we get in the car at eight o'clock, we're already working and we use that time better with, with our families longer. So there, there's, there's definitely, I think, that particular impact. And there are insurance companies that have put autonomous vehicles as a risk and, and reports. Partially autonomous, to me, that should be beneficial for the auto insurance industry because you would assume that would reduce frequency and severity, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you think most partial autonomous is gonna be done not just when it's safer to do it, but that when the autonomous is actually safer than the driver. I would say if I'm driving to El Paso and I-10, if my, my car is much less likely to fall asleep than I am, <laughs> I would think. Um, so, and you don't have to worry about uh, pedestrians and those, you know, you have to worry about deer crossing road kind of things, but your autonomous car might even be able to pick that up better than you can. Uh -huh. So in the case of that, whenever we're going to even worry someone that we do like hit the roof of the car, like the car is, I know for most electric vehicles, whenever they have that self-driving function, they're, they're seen as reading like the lines. Yeah. Um, so wouldn't that be like a uh, thing to worry about in case that if you're driving along this road and the back is really well marked? Well, the, the car could certainly tell you if that's a problem. So I, I would see they could design it that way if it just can't tell where the lines are. My car likes to tell me that I'm I'm getting out of the lane. Yeah. And it irritates me. Yeah. So it stopped doing it recently. I think I just got so irritated with it. Uh, but there's times where it doesn't even try to do it. And it's, it's those places where you just, you know, the road's not as well marked. Uh, but I could see I could see a redesign of roads. I have a lot of people who just think that's not true, but the very that very purpose, you know, roads are designed for eyesight, but cars, you know, they have they have more than eyesight that yeah. they can rely on. And so you could redesign roads so that those kind of things wouldn't be an issue. You wouldn't even have to paint the roads anymore. They would just, you know, you so just have computer chips. Five, the symbols wear off, and I know in the PTSA, you know, there's like there's some signs like on the road of everything that say, oh, you gotta take this or you gotta turn that way out or yeah, and I think the car designers prefer to, to rely on things other than sight because it's really hard to get a car to use its cameras like a human eye. Um, but I, I think we could redesign roads. So maybe it doesn't replace cars, but it replaced cars when you most want them replaced, like a six hour drive in the middle of nowhere. Driving west, you know, a, a, an autonomous car could handle that pretty well. We could redesign the roads as well, such that. Um, no pedestrians, right? We just say, hey, this is all this this roadway is autonomous vehicles, no pedestrians allowed. That one lady that was killed was a pedestrian. 
Um, she was partly at fault from the way she approached the road, but then a driver probably would have avoided her, whereas the car didn't, and the autonomous car didn't. But, you know, the, the reason I mention this is we make statements like that'll never happen out of heaven, but never happened. But these type of things, when they take off like AI, we suddenly become really comfortable with a lot of things changing pretty rapidly overnight. So these things tend to nothing happens, nothing happens, and then suddenly it all changes. So I'll say I, I want full autonomous because when I turn 80, I don't want to be driving. <laughs> I want someone driving me uh, because I have terrible night vision. You know, I just don't want to take that risk. And I don't want to have to be sitting at home because I have a car. I have a friend who has who has lost his sight and has relied on other people driving him everywhere. Autonomous vehicle would be a, a wonderful thing. Um, this last one, I do think this one definitely is already happening where cars are being designed to do things that we don't know, we don't notice. They're doing things, noticing you're doing something dangerous and her mind screams at me if I need a break. I don't know if you does that. The first time, time I did that, it scared the life at me. I almost had a wreck because of it. Um, it's like, whoa, what is that? So uh, that's only happened twice. Don't worry. I'm not like slamming on the brakes all the time. So I, I want to do, I, we'll, we'll do this next time. I do want to talk about this. I don't know if any of y'all thought about doing autonomous vehicles. It's not as as exciting of a topic was before because there seemed to be some some leeriness of this, but it would make a good topic. We'll talk a little bit more about it next class. We have an exam on Monday. We're only going to work the two math problems in here. So the essays you submit on Blackboard by six o'clock on Monday. Just make sure everybody's clear on this. That that rubric looks awfully short, but it's it's not there's a lot of writing in there. So you start off by explaining cap M. That's those first first four. Okay, the first four is about a fourth of the question. It's just explaining basic cap M. So cap M says we need a model to measure how we're going to get paid for risk. But there's two types of risks. Some are systematic, some are unsystematic. We're only paid for systematic risk. That's market risk. We're not paid for taking unsystematic risk because it can be easily eliminated for diversification. You put all that, you can say it in more words than I just said there, but certainly explain it. it. May give some examples of systematic risk, you know, interest rates, inflation, the economy, those type of things. Unsystematic risk, company specific. Give the cap and formula just so we understand how the formula actually incorporates that. So I would definitely say here's cap and formula and beta. In this formula is what measures systematic risk. So this is stuff you've had probably in three or four different finance classes so far. Then you got to make the transition, and I'm a little picky on the transition because what does it have to do with insurance? So the the next question is say what does it have to do with insurance? So um, insurance predominantly covers unsystematic risks. So there's a lot of discussion in there. Should management be spending stockholders' resources to buy, to eliminate a risk the stockholders have already eliminated? There are some risks covered by insurance that are more systematic, such as directors and officers, maybe workers' comp, but for most of them, property risks, liability risks, those are very company-specific risks, all right? And then the next one we use is for students use a lot of points because they just, their entire answer is expense leakage it's like and then there's expensive leakage you got to explain that or how to unless you know what it means what i mean there so all risk including even the systematic ones when you buy insurance it's this left pocket right pocket if you pay the insurance premium that is an expense for you it becomes a revenue for the insurance company if you have a claim you have a loss you get reimbursed and that becomes an expense you can't come out ahead and in fact, you'd lose. Why? Because the insurance company has employees to manage this business. So essentially, you're just you're just killing your portfolio. So make sure that that's fully explained. And then the last part is usually pretty easy. Most people get full credit in the last part. So given all of that, and, and corporations do buy insurance. So find four of the reasons. I gave you a few more than four, but find four of the reasons you can explain. I'm usually pretty generous on that. So really, where pe students lose their points are these down here, some up here just, um, I think I've forgotten cap M, so go back and refresh. If you don't know cap M, then you got to know that before you graduate anyway. 
pretty, pretty critical theory of finance. All right, questions on that? If I had to pick one of the thing on the list, what, what, what do you think you're gonna do worse on on that list? You're gonna do equally well or equally poorly on all of them? What is, you feel comfortable on all of them? All right, well, if you think of one, let me know. The second one is uh, the model claims. So a little bit of history. You can do a lot of this almost entirely from that 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 article I gave y'all, which is highlighted. So it's it's almost all in there, except for the storm surge piece. So a little bit of history, you know, the increased claims, the bald the Baldwins or bald ridges. I get that mixed up. Talk about the frequency severity, and since it's open book, you could actually give the numbers. So I want to see that you know what frequency is. That's the the number of claims and severity. That's the average size of the claim. I would put those both in there. Do mention that Texas already has the highest rates, at least at the time this article was written. That may not be true today. And then the key to this, which a lot of students completely miss, is why is this so important? And it's so important for both storm surge and mold in that, I mean, be real clear here, insurance companies write products, policies, assuming a certain frequency and severity, a certain interpretation of the policy. If courts reinterpret that in a way that greatly increases frequency and severity, the insurance company is either going to increase their rates dramatically or they're going to get out of business. That wording interpretation is horrible for the insurance industry because they're assuming a certain frequency and severity. And if, if that's in, reinterpreted by the courts, that radically changes that. What does that have to do with storm surge? Well, a lot of students really mess, a lot of students get zero points on the storm surge. The language on storm surge, I argued is very, very clear. So far, the courts have not reinterpreted that. They've been really clear insurance companies do not cover storm surge, that's flood insurance. But after Katrina, it was certainly being challenged and you saw that challenge. There were some pretty heavyweight politicians saying they were going to make insurance companies pay for this storm surge. So that's the key there. What I wanted to show you is that this issue comes up more than once. Mold wasn't the only one. It came up under storm surge. The industry won that argument, but if they had not won the argument, it would have been a much more massive issue than the mold was. And the mold was a pretty massive issue, all right? Who are the players? You can get that out of the article pretty easily. What do insurance companies do? They say, hey, we'll take our toys and we'll go home. Um, states try to regulate that by saying, well, you can go home with your home insurance policies, but you got to take your auto insurance with you. So there's a little bit of play in there. And then the compromise with the regulators, just, you know, the $5,000 coverage, you can buy more if you need, that kind of thing. All right. On the players, give a quick view of the players. You know, I, I that's in the class notes as well as being in the articles. So what is each each group saying. And remember the insurers, I mean, the insurers is really two groups. The insurers are those people who file mold claims, which is, you know, a small percentage. And the insurers are those that don't pay mold claims, but are going to see their rates rise dramatically because of it. So there's really two groups there. The real estate industry, I really think, is what saved the insurance industry because no one cares about insurers. But when realtors are saying we can't sell houses, that's when the legislature moves. You don't have to mention, but it is somewhat, I think, interesting, this argument that at the time all this was happening, Texas had a very somewhat pro-industry regular uh, insurance commissioner in Jose Montemayor. I'm not sure he would say that. I think, I think he would believe he was balanced. But in this environment, if you're balanced, you're pro-industry because most of the states are becoming much more consumerist in their insurance commissioners and I think I think he tried I, I think he was too a very honest broker he really looked at the facts and say hey here's the answer so I'm not I'm not saying he was in a hip pocket industry I just think he looked at the problem he was a statistician and just said hey so I actually have tremendous respect for him 
All right, what on this list? So the two biggest losses on this are the wording interpretation and the storm surge link. A lot of students just don't. I mean, their entire essay is, and this is also true for storm surge. And that's it. It's like, no, it's not also true. It's very different for storm surge. It could have been the same. It would have been a disaster, but it wasn't. So you got to be really, really clear here. Any questions on that? Or is there one item on that? All right, the PML while doing class should be an easy question, but I don't have a YouTube to give you. But if you go back to the class videos, you can look at those problems. Plus, they're worked completely in the notes as well. So you should be able to find it in the notes. Everybody remember that one? Anybody remember the formula? Which 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 what is your P, which number is your PML? Yeah, plus one. You don't really need in parentheses, but on your calculator you probably should. I mean it's the order of operand, but yeah. So it'd be whatever that is, um 9901, I guess. Don't trust me on that. And then make sure you include uh, responses. What can they do? And you're more likely it's they're going to be over their PML. And their PMLs be greater than their uh, capacity. So remember what they can do. They can issue more stocks. They can do reinsurance. They can raise prices, which is kind of slow. They can gear rig the model a little bit, which is a little bit fake. So don't forget putting those into your answer. And then the securitization problem, you should all get 100 on that, but some students have exam anxiety. So I'd recommend, you know, work it, work it. What I usually do for exam like this is I'll work one problem, the same problem over and over again. Some students say, can you give me 20 more problems? But this, this one is the exact same thing every time. I work one problem over and over again. That way, if I get stuck on the exam, I have the problem I practice memorized, and I'll work that and get the answer, just make sure I get the math right. I remember doing that in my graduate school, and I did it on one problem just over and over again, and that was the question he put on the exam. So I already knew the answer. <laughs> it's like, oh, great. This, I think I got this one. I worked it like 20 times. So yours won't be one of the ones we worked. I'll have a different answer, but you know, just be able to work through that. That one, you do have a YouTube that works you through it. There's no, there's no essay to that one. That really is just, just number crunching. There is some essay on this one. That you'll do in class not a lot but you know what what's your response but there's no essay here it's just pure math just plug and plug and write down your answers do show all your work i get partial credit if you show your work if you don't show your work i don't give any partial credit so write the formulas out in fact you can get the answer absolutely wrong and get 100 percent credit just because you added two and three and got seven and not I'm assuming that's in exam anxiety. I'm assuming y'all all know how to add numbers. So those kind of things, not a big, big deal. It is irritating to me because it takes me an extra 45 seconds to grade it, but that's okay. It's a small class. So I'd rather you get the right answer because then I can grade it a lot faster, but uh, I will give you as much partial as I can. All right, so that's it. Each question is weighted by its minutes. So 20 75ths, 20 75ths, 15 75ths, and 20, just like the CFA exam. So, Y'all got it? So the two essays, we do 6 o'clock on Monday on Blackboard. I'll, I'll put them out there, and then we'll work these last two in class. Everybody's good? Ah, I thought I had it down. What is it? Alt. Control shift H. I thought I did that. There we go. All right. All right. I want to go a little bit on some of this on auto autonomous vehicles. Um, would be a great paper two topic still, although it's gotten a little bit of a uh, 
it's kind of been pushed back a little bit. I think for the insurance industry, the first one is is the most risky for them. Full, fully autonomous. So let me tell you what the insurance, and you'll see it in the notes, what the insurance industry will say, no problem. And why did I say that? First, it is say cars would cost more. So insurance costs more. And since say, yeah, there'll be fewer accidents, but when the accidents happen, the damage is going to be much more. So we're still going to have hefty premiums. Um, it will. So it's going to reduce frequency, but increase severity. That's their answer. And that's probably always going to be true. I don't think um, I don't think an autonomous vehicle, even with all the, you know, innovation will ever be as cheap as a non-autonomous vehicles. There's a lot of software, a lot of programming going on there. So that's somewhat their argument. Your professor says, not if people stop buying cars. So that's, now this has to be 100% of cars. So you live in New York City, your spouse has a car, they drive to work. You have a car, you drive to work. The only reason you have two cars is because your work places are very different. Wouldn't you likely get rid of one of those cars and use autonomous vehicles to get to work? It's cheaper, more convenient, especially in New York City. You know, if you're gonna park, that's gonna be 50 bucks a week or something or a day even. Um, well, having a car that's gonna drive you right to the doorstep and it's gonna be cheaper you're going to buy insurance and all that. So it might not be, 100% cars goes away, but it's a good chance 20, 30% of cars. People will buy fewer cars. And again, I, I do think this is an S curve. So I think there's a sudden change that will happen. I do think, just like we're seeing with uh, 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 artificial intelligence right now, where you just suddenly like, wow, where did that come from? Now, there's a little bit of debate, and I think this is why the insurance industry is, is kind of watching carefully. I don't know if y'all have noticed, Tesla has a very different autonomous approach than a lot of others, um, like reliance on cameras versus other types. So there's still a lot to be worked out here. I, I've never driven a Tesla. I don't know if any of y'all have Teslas. I don't know how many college students own Teslas, probably not a whole lot. Uh, has anyone driven a Tesla and gotten the experience of the car taking over? Did it, did it take over the driving? Yeah. Did you, did you feel comfortable doing it or did you yeah, feel? But it was actually making all the decisions. I mean, I think some of you jump. I mean, it, it felt pretty solid and it didn't feel like it was like, you know, like your heart rate's not. Yeah, uh, the big truckers are doing that where they're, they're doing autonomous trucks, but they have to have a, a person in the truck. And it's pretty amazing what they're doing. Um, and that's where the innovation is going to come in. They're thinking some innovation where you have an autonomous vehicle and you get a point where the car just can't figure it out. So it just stops. So, well, now what do you do? Where you take over? And they're even saying, even then, you're going to have these computer bases, places that people are going to, some driver, remote driver is going to look at the camera, take the car out of that situation, and you won't do anything. You know, they're thinking about all these different types of things. So we'll see. It may not happen at all, but you've got some pretty big names working on this. This part, I, I do think this one's much more likely to happen where certain types of uh, trips will be allowed. Um, I'm not sure that's going to have a huge impact on insurance because the trips, the auto, the autonomous vehicle will take over were probably low frequency, low severity events, or at least low frequency events anyway. It might reduce frequency and severity some, but it's probably not gonna be a radical change because a lot of accidents happen in the city where you're likely not to have autonomous. Um, and then the last one, car takes over in the emergency. That one is already there and I'm, I'm sure the Institute of Highway Safety 
is already starting to collect data on those type of things. Um, does it actually reduce frequency and severity or is it distracting to the driver or does it make the driver pay less attention because they're assuming the car is going to, I mean, I mentioned that with my, uh, my cruise control. I think it does tend to make me less, pay less, but not as observant as I would have normally been. So, you know, and we don't always know you have these kind of technologies, they come in and then you're a little bit surprised five years later, but we're pretty good at adjusting. Um, one question people have asked up here is cyber attacks. I don't know enough about the software in these cars. So that's right now the chance that 100,000 cars all have an accident at the same time is pretty low because they're unrelated. It's lots of drivers. Uh, I've seen some of those big pileup wrecks, but that's usually, you know, 40, 50 cars. It's not thousands of them. What if someone could tap in to the software and cause every car to just crash all at the same time? Is that possible? You know, who knows? It's certainly not possible today, but it's, you know, it's at least conceivably possible. Don't we already have that issue with airlines? <laughs> Don't planes fly <laughs> autonomously most of the time, probably 90% of the time. Um, and, and they've had that issue with pilots. Of uh, Pilot training is, man, um, I was reading a paper that said, uh, the regulations are all wrong. They're talking about the number of hours that pilots fly, and that's not the case. It's the number of active hours. It's when they're doing emergency stuff. Having a pilot sit there for 10,000 hours where the computer is doing 90% of the work is not really sharpening our skills. So we may be coming to that kind of thing with, with driving. We just the, uh, we have a generation that just doesn't know how to drive cars. You know, Once you get to that point, what are you, you going to do? Do you think they'll miss it, teenagers? There's already, you know, already papers out there that teenagers are not driving as much as their their parents did. So, so the world could be changing. Just a few things just to catch from this article. Um, this is an old one, eight years ago. Insurance companies say it won't put an end to auto insurance. It may not put it into it, but it could radically change it. It could definitely radically shrink it. <clears throat> they will not eliminate the risk of car ownership that's assuming they own their car so uh, i was speaking uh usa had me come speak to their risk managers and i brought this issue up and my my argument for them was uh yeah it's probably many years away it could be nothing and it could shrink your company 70 percent if i were usa i would set up a department to study this some actuaries and start talking to Tesla and some other places, maybe Uber, about us being the insurer of choice for autonomous vehicles. And let's let's make sure, because someone's going to insure these cars, but if you don't own the car, you don't care. If Uber, now I think Uber's, Uber's business model is asset light. If Uber starts buying a bunch of autonomous vehicles, that radically changes their business model. I'm not sure they're going to be able to do that. Uber has talked about that. I don't know if there's uh, actually articles on that. Ah, yeah, Uber. I'm sure there's plenty of articles out there. So if if Uber starts buying cars, wow, it's that's a capital heavy industry right now. They're there's it's like they got the best. They, they're making money off of other people's assets. That's about the best thing you can do. Um, some people think their model will still be asset light, except they will buy the cars and we'll lease them out to Uber and then our car will go all our place. I guess that's possible. And so Uber just becomes a software company. That, that could be possible. I don't know. Um, I don't know what, if you look at Uber's balance sheet, if they're actually buying these cars yet or testing them. But the driver is a good 70, 80% of the cost of an Uber. So you can eliminate a lot of costs of Uber. Uh, I've, I've had students do uh, cost benefit analysis. If the cost of an Uber drops 70%, would it make sense not to buy a car and use Uber 100%? And, you know, they're, they're getting as close. It almost makes sense. 
and it definitely makes sense for that second card if you're only driving 5,000 miles a year. You know, then it just absolutely makes sense. Why spend that money on a card that you don't use all that much? Um, so, so the frequency of accidents will decline. The severity will go up. Cars loaded with high-tech parts are going to cost more. There may be different forms of coverage. Now, if you don't own the car, um, could you possibly be in an autonomous vehicle and be considered liable for the wreck? Can you think of scenarios? It's hard, it's hard to imagine one, but is it possible? I guess you could have done something where you, you, you damaged the car or you did something strange. I don't know. Um, it seems to me most of your liability, if not all of it, will disappear. Um, but do you need cyber coverage? In case someone, your neighbor doesn't like you and they go in and rig your software or whatever, who knows? Um, <clears throat> well, driverless cars could be on the road by 2020. So <laughs> this article is only, you know, what, about a decade too, too early. They won't be cheap. Now, notice here, this is, to me, these are the strange things. Newcomers, new, Tesla's not a newcomer anymore, but listing Google as a new cover in the auto industry. The auto industry is a horrible industry. Thin margins, huge capital requirements. I don't know if you've ever looked at an auto manufacturer. I mean, this is not the industry you would want. My money. Airlines is the same way. Thin margins, heavy capital requirement. The advantage that airlines have is their unearned revenue. They get they get their revenues well before they earn them, so they get this wonderful cash flow. Auto auto manufacturers don't have that. <clears throat> I would rate them very low because they keep interrupting me here. But um, yeah, they don't even have operating income. But if you look at their gross profit. That's like a Costco, Walmart gross profit. <laughs> and these are thin gross, gross in, in their net profit, you know, it's a negative number, so you can't even look at it. Now, Tesla does have a much wider margin than these companies. If you look at that, especially the fact that they're actually making money. So 13 over 81, that's unheard of in the auto manufacturing business. That's why I don't, not so sure Uber is going to do well in this, this, this market, you know, this uh, buying cars, you know, this, this a lot of capital, it's very expensive and you got to make a return on that capital. So, um, you know, it's not a good business. Why in the world would Google get into this business? Now, Google's business is pretty asset heavy as well. Um, you know, they do have a lot of servers and computers, but it's not nearly the manufacturing heft. And is Google actually going to produce cars? Or are they only going to produce software? You know, so who knows? But it's interesting to see Google, Apple, Amazon in these in these lists. Now, Tesla has started their trucks, and I don't know who's going to be the autonomous, um, you know, 18 wheeler producers. Um, I think that's where the real money money is. There's a much better better margins in that business, and that tends to be somewhat of a monopoly business anyway. Um, so, <clears throat> your car can talk to other cars. They can find the least con time consuming routes. Um, they can link up cars, so uh, tailgating won't be such a bad thing anymore. Um, reducing current car lengths required for safety and the amount of road space needed. 95% of all crashes now are due to driver error. I don't know what the other 5% are, if that's deer running across the road or what all, but 95%. Uh, so they have some data because Google has driven, I don't know how many millions of miles, um, and they can somewhat compare the two. Um, Groups most affected, teenagers, seniors, um, disabled people. It's also probably going to be good for DUIs, but I don't understand why DUIs aren't using Uber 
already. So, you know, but uh, maybe be a cheaper, cheaper Uber. <clears throat> now, it says one thing is for sure we don't believe this whole sentence makes no sense. You can't have 100% confidence in something that, and then you say, we don't believe. So these two are so 100% confidence, maybe. So, but we don't believe we will be obsolete. I think there's a good chance that we obsolete. I think there's a good chance Valero could be obsolete. You know, the world is really radically changing. So the industry is, essentially is kind of just saying, no problem, we're not worried about it. This is not going to happen. This was eight years ago. So it still hasn't happened, but again, that S curve can kick up quickly. A few other articles. If you if you decide to do autonomous vehicles for your paper, you're gonna have to find much more current articles. Um, this article focuses on the impact on the driver. Life is much easier for us. I would love autonomous vehicles. I hope they come around before I turn 80 because I really would like to get rid of my car. I'm hoping my Prius Prime gets me to 80. I think it could last 20 years. Um, and then I just don't buy another car and I just use use uh, autonomous, um, especially in the cities. Um, they could look a lot different because you don't need to all be sitting forward. Um, autonomous vehicles will also challenge the notion of car ownership we talked about. Google reckoned that shared self-driving taxis could be could have utilization rates of more than 75%. A much smaller number of cars we needed, probably 30% of the cars we have today. Self-driving vehicles could, in short, reduce urban vehicle numbers by as much as 90%. It obviously transform car makers. There's not a car maker out there that's not thinking about this. They're much more focused on what, though, right now? Probably EVs. Right, everybody's focused on EVs right now because that's what everybody's debating. Um, but there's, it's still there. Every major car producer has some type of autonomous uh, innovation group going on. Um, so the industry, just like the the auto insurance industry, just like the insurance industry, and saying, hey, people are still going to want to own their own cars. Um, is that just denial? Car making is not the only industry. Obviously, insurance, we don't cover that. So there are insurers that did, at the time of this article, put something in their SEC filings about autonomous vehicles. So that if you did a paper two, you would probably go to Allstate, Hartford, and just search on the word autonomous and just see, are they still saying anything about that? Um, or you could pick up these companies. Cincinnati, Cincinnati is a pretty good size uh, insurance company. Uh, we saw this before. The three leading causes are alcohol, speed, and distraction. That's that's kind of interesting. Driverless cars cannot drink alcohol, break the speed limit, or get distracted. So accidents should occur much less often. The number of accidents would fall, and who knows if this is correct, from 5.5 million to 1.3 million, and deaths from 32,000 to 11,000. So I bet you can find an updated article that would have an updated estimate on that. Once self-driving vehicles become available, some places will probably ban ordinary cars on the roads. We'll see if that happens. Now, what the economist was saying is uh, cars are getting banned in favor of bikes. And so these, I don't know how many of y'all have the uh, the electric bike thing that's becoming much more popular. You all see them on campus. I rode my bike in um, Las Vegas. It was a really great place. It's out in the mountains. And this 80-something-year-old woman, she just goes flying by me on her bike. And she's like looking at me like, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you have no physical abilities. But she had a motor on her bike. It wasn't quite fair, but because she was going to get 20, 25 miles an hour. I mean, I think, but, but more and more cities are closing down streets just for cyclists, just for walkers. So the cities are trying to eliminate the cars. And a lot of them, I think, are going to see autonomous vehicles as a huge advantage. I think in here, they talk about how much of downtown Santa, a, a city like San Antonio, how much of the downtown is parking. It's a huge amount. It's a really huge waste of real estate. Uh, Self-driving vehicles. 
uh, would make traffic flow more smoothly. Um, they wouldn't have to brake erratically. They could be routed to avoid congestion. 90% of penetration of self-driving cars in America would be equivalent to doubling of road capacity and would cut delays 60%. So there's also a productivity side to this. Productivity gains worth, who knows where they got that number. Children, the elderly, the disabled could gain more independence. Uh, no more soccer moms and soccer dads, which could be pretty sad, right? Because people just don't say, hey, go to soccer. Good luck with the game. Um, and parking space, parking accounts for as much as a fourth of cities. Um, there's as many as 3.5 parking spaces per car. People looking for parking account for 30% of the miles. So not only that, but, you know, if you want to make the uh, global warming argument, there's a lot of wasted CO2 that people just drive around walking, watch, looking for spaces. It also allows more people to actually live in the city. Um, but it could also make it easier to live outside the city because your driving time commuting is now productive time. You can start sleeping time. That's kind of, that was my dream. You know, you get up at six o'clock, get in your car, it has a bed and a pillow, and you get another two hours of sleep. You don't care, you hope it's bumper to bumper. And you get up every 30 minutes and hit send on an email, so it looks like you're working, right? Did y'all ever do that? Get up at 3 a.m. and send an email just so you sent it at 3 a.m. Um, all right, so. <clears throat> Journey home may go, go to go a bit like this. You leave your office, an empty car rolls up, perhaps you summon it, or maybe this is a regular pickup. On the way home, you listen to your favorite music. You can see these, this is The Economist. They don't know how to spell in England. Watch a television show or catch up with the news. You barely notice if the car slows down or speeds up, except for when it pulls aside to let an ambulance through. Some of the other cars have drivers using steering wheel, but many of them like yours have no wheel at all. Despite that, hold up your journey is much faster, even though there are more cars on the road. When you arrive home, the car heads off to its next client or to park somewhere and wait for a call you don't know or care. That sounds like a better world to me. I like that better. Um, that idea, you know, there's people that say, I just really like driving. So you go to a theme park, learn to ride to the theme park is a you know, 2020, 2020 car. Your kid, you know, your kids are like, wow, it's so cool. We got to get in a car and you, you push this button down and it goes faster. Yeah, so that'd be that become a theme, theme ride, or theme park ride. Um, despite the whole opening journey, yeah. So next car you need. Now, I think the question is gonna be, are they gonna really be that efficient? Yeah, if the car shows up in five minutes, that's great. If it takes 45 minutes. <laughs> because everybody's going to the same concert at the same time, you know, that's the problem. Now ride share is gonna be a lot more efficient because you know, the software is gonna say, hey, these six people are going to the same spot, let's put them all together. I don't know how, I've, I don't know if y'all have done the Uber when they try to do that. They ask you if you're willing to share a ride and y'all done that. I don't know how much it saves you, but um, I'm kind of nervous, like, you know, who you can get stuck with, but, you know, maybe it saves you 20 bucks. Um, you have wireless internet in your cars. Um, that's why Google wants us doing this. Um, the cars are going to be connected. So, yeah, you know, the last thing you want is all the autonomous vehicles say, hey, it's a lot faster if we go this way. And then suddenly you have 20,000 cars all taking the same road. Well, affect the way vehicles are made. Eventually, it is the connected car that may deliver a driverless future. Um, it may radically changed DoorDash and FedEx and these other companies. Um, now they're talking about drones, you know, driverless drones doing that same type of thing, but a, a driverless car to deliver food could be really small. <laughs> it only needs to be big enough for the food. And I think I've seen some of the cities where they actually have the little robots kind of the, that run around the city, you know, and we're kind of getting there. They're not going 40 miles an hour, so you gotta be pretty close. I saw one firm that was doing alcohol with that, like that, but with a dog instead of a, a robot. <laughs> the first bunch is made of a service and applications delivered via mobile networks or car, um, smartphones or tablets carried by the driver. The most obvious examples are these systems. They stream music, video, satellite navigation, just do everything. Um, the second type of technology is consists of services based on data supplied from the car advanced warnings. A third, um, 
brings together multiple vehicles. So if you did paper two, what you're going to notice is the different levels of autonomous and kind of the ultimate where we just we're just this one big machine all all working together, not even paying attention to what's going on around us. So what's always the key is what do the politicians, the regulators say? They're usually the last ones on board. Now it depends. Um, a lot of cities are trying to make um, the use of smartphones, you know, texting while driving, those type of things, make that illegal. However, city council members tend to do that more than the average citizen. They're worse texters and they're worse telephone users than the general public. So they either pass a law and they violate it, or they pass a law but makes sure hands-free is still allowed. Why? Because they're wealthier and they can afford the hands-free. Um, so a lot of this depends on on what, you know, I think that's, that's happened in a few cities that wanted to outlaw Uber, but the people voting use Uber all the time and they're thinking, wow, this could be really inconvenient for me. So, you know, you got to get the regulators on, on board and they're going to answer to who are the loudest voices are. Um, so, you know, this isn't a regulator. This is, I mean, this isn't a politician, but, you know, the regulators as well. Um, traffic lights. That's the other one. Talk about fuel savings. Now, I already do this because I got a Prius. When you own a, own a Prius Prime, you're just obsessed with mileage. It's just all you think about all day long. And so if I see a lights changing, I'm not going to go up to it at 40 miles an hour. I'm going to coast up at 10 miles an hour. And a guy behind me is going to be just irate. It's like, yeah, why are we racing to the light bar? There's nothing to do there. Um, but a computer is going to do that far more efficiently. Not only will they do it more, but they're going to know when the light changes. <laughs> They're going to communicate with that light. And not only that, if it's only autonomous vehicles, they'll change the light because you're the only car sitting there. And so instead of sitting there for 10 minutes, you'll just, you'll just go. So that, that kind of interconnectivity could be pretty major. Um, so that coordination between cars, between uh, lights. Who will deliver all these motoring services is far from clear. Um, we don't know if it's going to be traditional car makers. Um, who knows? Car sharing, we talked about that rather than uh, now the sharing economy has been there's several have tried this, like sharing uh, work tools and other kind of things that just haven't worked very, very well. Um, I don't know how Airbnb and these others, you know, it's this whole shared economy, it'd be interesting. Um, a lot of people are sharing stuff they own. I think that changes it. When you open up your 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 apartment to an Airbnb, you got you got strangers in your house. Here we're talking about a shared economy where you don't actually own the asset. I think it, it does change things, and I don't think people are quite as touchy about a car as they are about their own house and, and beds. Um, and with increasing automation and connectivity, we less need to have to own their own vehicle yourself. So we talked about. Um, all right, I think this is real similar. Yeah, this this forecast is probably way, way, way off. Um, yeah, I, I'll let you read the rest of that. So you can see these articles are really easy to find. My guess is Now, you're not writing a paper. If you choose this, you're not writing a paper of autonomous vehicles. What are you writing, writing a paper of? An insurance, right? So make sure you can talk autonomous vehicles, but you got to make a strong, a big part of your paper has to be, in fact, most of your paper needs to be the impact on the insurance industry. All right. So you, plenty of article come up. Autonomous vehicles and the insurance industry. That's a 2017 article. Um, insurance for autonomous. So there's gonna be plenty of stuff out there. And here's an idea of what the car might look like. That doesn't look too pleasant to me. The last thing I wanna do is sit staring at someone like that, but um, you know, maybe they make it a little little, little more uh, friendly than that. But 
but it, it, it certainly is a topic that will have plenty of stuff to write about. The do paper too, you need at least one good solid article or three or four kind of halfway articles. So a good solid article that, that would appear in something like Forbes or you know several pages and has a lot of meat to it. Um, yeah, some articles about some special issues they've had with driverless cars. Um, this one's, I think, a little bit of humorous, actually. Um, they obeyed the law at all time, without exception, these driverless cars. This might sound like the right, right way to program, but good luck trying to merge onto a chaotic, jam-packed highway with traffic flying along well above the speed limit. It tends not to work well as the accidents have piled up. The arguments among programmers, um, should they teach the cars to actually break the law sometimes, just like a human would do? So yeah, there's some artificial intelligence here. Um, turns out though, their accident rates are twice as high as for regular cars, according to a study. Um, they usually hit from behind and slow speed crash get, get, they're usually hit from behind. So that's part of the problem. You have people obeying the law or you have cars obeying the law where we weren't used to that in the past. And so it's, it's a new animal. I'm not sure this is a big issue because we're gonna adjust and adapt those kind of things we'll figure out. And that's part of the problem writing these futuristic articles is we're, it's, it's going to change. We're going to, it's going to be a lot different than we, we could have imagined. So, I mean, just go back to the 40s and 50s and look at pictures of people flying on airplanes. It was a very different time back then. <laughs> Doesn't look anything like that now. They would have been horrified if they saw what we do today. All right. So, cer certainly a good topic. I don't know why that changed in here, but okay. All right, one last thing I want to get here. Chris, when we get a chance, uh, just going back to the exam, can we go over leakage a little bit more? Leakage? Yeah. All right, so. Um, just, just later, whenever you have time. Well, I'll do it now. I'm about to switch to a new topic. All right, so the best thing to do here is actually do the math problem I did in, in class. You have two companies, one's the insured, one's the insurer, they're both in your portfolio. All right, that's the way to think about it. And the question I ask, is there any scenario where your portfolio comes out ahead because you own both the insured and the insurer? My argument is no, it's impossible. Why? If there are no claims, one company pays the insurance premium, the other one receives it, that's a wash but the insurance company's paying employees to manage this account. So they're paying employees. That's leaving your insurance portfolio. I mean, that's leaving your stock portfolio. If there is a claim, you have the premium and the premium. This company pays the loss. The insurance company reimburses the loss. It's still just left pocket. I mean, you just, but then the, the insurance company spends even more money on employees to adjust the loss. So the only conceivable outcome for your portfolio is you're going to be you're going to have lower net income overall because you're going to be paying these employees of the insurance company to manage this business. All right, that's what leakage link, link means. That makes sense. If you want to do an actual math problem like I did, you know, you certainly can. I think I think it's out there. Um, under miscellaneous. Yeah, I think it's this insurance and CAPM example. We'll see. I'm not used to the downloads going up there. I don't know, when did that change? It's like overnight, didn't it? Yeah, well, have y'all noticed that? I, I did it once and I looked up, I had I clicked on it like six times. It's like, oh, it's, so it's, so Brandon, it's out there as an Excel file with an example, if you want to look at it. So you could actually put, if, now, if it's hard to explain, you could, you know, put the example on the on the exam if you wanted to. Use different numbers, but you could certainly do that. All right. And that one's under the. Uh, it's under. Insurance and capital. Exactly. Yeah, that's the name. Of, that is the name of the file. It's an Excel file. Yeah. I probably should have named it expense expense leakage. But... All right. 
let's talk a little bit on telemax just in case you want this to be your your paper topic um interesting choice of uh pictures but um so how good of a driver you are are you studies have found that most people think they're above average which is possible statistically you know people say that's not possible it is actually possible that 80 percent are above average if the 20 percent are just so horrendously bad um so you know that's that's possible you can still come out with the same averages because you're skewed but i i, I seriously doubt 80 percent of drivers are above average drivers um underwriters have traditionally used age location um sex you know obviously guys are considered to be more aggressive drivers their monetary customers motoring habits if they can actually see how you drive we can get more accurate. So the, the key here is to get real life information. Um, so put it in your car. Um, now there's some people who want this to radically change insurance, such so that you you pay for your insurance each drive. So you get in your car and it's, it's like there's a meter going. And if you drive and mine doesn't monitor if I'm speeding, I don't see why they couldn't do telematics to start monitoring if I'm speeding. Part of my issue is my car shows what the speed limit is and it's wrong about 10% of the time. So I'm not sure how accurate those things. Sometimes it's amazing. I'll be driving at 45 and there's a sign that changes to 40. And that's I mean the car changes to 40 right when I hit that sign. I mean, it's like, wow, that's really amazing. But there's other times it says it's 70 when it's clearly 60 or it says it's 60 when it's clearly 70. But that would be interesting, wouldn't it? If if you're speeding, they're going to charge you an extra 20 percent. If you have if you run a light, which could be possible. Right. But this is the idea of telematics actually used To actually price each one of your rides, because um, it obviously could tell how fast you're driving. Um, so doing 80 to 50. Uh, discounts can range from 10 to 40. Mine keeps telling me it's a 30% discount, but I don't know what it applies to. So um, now this, I don't think this campaign would work all that well. Um, the campaign is called Drive Like a Girl. They're trying to get teenage boys to drive better. And that's that's their pitch. Does that sound like any of y'all, some of y'all were teenage boys not too long ago. Would that have gotten your attention to drive better? It's insulting the guys and the girls, I think. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, but anyway, that's their thought is that the teenage girls drive better than teenage boys. But um, I don't, I don't think that particular one. And, and they say, well, we we can fix it. We'll say you don't need to be a girl to drive like one. That that'll get teenage boys to drive better. So I'm not sure they really thought through that that campaign. Um, now, what do insurance companies get from this? Well, insurance companies actually like, and, and they'll they say this and they really believe it. So I'm not, I'm, this isn't their kind of their marketing pitch. They want to charge people what they really should be paid for insurance. They want to charge people exactly what their frequency and severity says. And that's how you, you talk to an actuary, that's the way they think, is there's no gaming going on. They're not saying that to sound good. Um, and anything that makes their pricing more accurate, they like it. Now, they're always going to bring up that word availability, which obviously ignores the affordability of the bad drivers. But the problem they have are the false positives. So there are if they charge people based on age and gender, they're going to be overcharging some people who really are good drivers, but are just in the wrong category. And so telematics gets them more precision so they don't have those false positives. That's that's a huge, huge thing. Um, now, I don't know if they talk about this in this article, but it would be good for, for a paper topic. And I think we talked a little bit about it in class is will telematics change how we drive? So if you have telematics and it's charging you every time you drive, are you going to drive differently try to get that rate down? Right now, it's not too good of a kick because you drive six months, nine months, and then you might get a discount. If you get in your car, every time you get in your car, you're gonna you're gonna have, especially at the end of your ride, you can see your bill, and it's you know eighteen dollars. Oh my word, I shouldn't drive a hundred miles an hour. Um, you know, would it change? And that's one of the things um, some companies I know USA was testing this. 
does having telematics in a car actually make teenage drivers better drivers? Or does it make teenage drivers' parents better parents, one or the other? So some of them are actually monitoring their kids driving. So that's that's kind of an important aspect of this that we just don't know yet. Um, so some held telematics as a way of improving driver's standards, making drivers more aware of how they're behaving dangerously. Um, they can beep when brakes are too heavy, alert emergency service. But customers are also worried about privacy. Um, Progressive uses telematics. Uh, according to this article, no longer monitors car's location for fear of appearing big brotherish. Um, their gizmos only stay plugged in for six months to get a snapshot. Now, uh, root insurance is, is one I would make part of this analysis. So if you decide to do this for paper two, um, there's a really good podcast. It's actually focused on insurance. And they interview Root, and it's fascinating. You could do almost your whole paper just on this interview. It's a really, really good interview, and and they talk they talk about uh, the it's a lot of artificial artificial intelligence, a lot of telematics. Um, I don't want I want to see Root the the insurance company um, on my. Uh, investor standpoint, I don't know if they're even publicly traded. So they do have a website you can get into, but it's not letting me in. I don't want to quote. No. All right, so well, well, we'll see. Supposedly when you come in, they're going to overcharge you intentionally, give you six months to drive, and then you can get a huge discount at the end depending on how you drive. Obviously, you're going to drive like perfectly for those six months because it's going to affect you. Um, so um, it's it's a huge deal. I, I actually think this has become more important than autonomous vehicles simply because it's we're already seeing it and it's having an impact. Um, another big question I would have is how how pervasive is it in the insurance industry? I'm assuming every major insurer is doing this. I don't know if any of y'all have State Farm. I assume State Farm's doing it. All states doing it. I know USA is. Progressive is. I assume Geico is. Anybody have Geico? I assume they're doing the same thing. Um, do any of y'all not know if your insurance company offers it? Not tried. I, I kept wanting to do it, but I kept forgetting to do it. And then I discovered I could do the whole thing online, which makes it a lot easier not to call in. Um, so the market is growing quickly. Customers like personalized discounts. That's that's very unique to the insurance industry. I mean, other than speeding tickets, that really personalizes it. But but that kind of personalized discount. Insurers create any source, and this is what I'm saying, this is absolutely true, any source that helps them sift those drivers who are above average from those who are merely believe they are. So um, great, great, great article. Yeah, I mentioned roundabouts. I think I, we saw it in that one website I showed y'all. You, you could find plenty. Uh, well, this isn't, but and you you'd be able to find plenty of topics in that. All right, uh, six fifty seven. Oh man. Um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you this one first. It's only two minutes. So. All right, this is um, from the Institute of Highway Safety. They have an entire YouTube channel. So if you're still trying to find a topic, they've got a lot of topics out there that are really interesting. You can write your paper off of videos. So you don't have to necessarily do it off of articles. Um, in fact, they have an entire series of really interesting videos called uh, The Physics of, of Driving, where they talk about weight and material and crunch zones and inertia and all these kind of things. It's very, very interesting. And, and it's actually one I think they should show in high schools for, for beginning drivers, because it, it just you understand how you drive can really affect the danger. But here's one on just the design of cars. So we got two cars here, one in the 50s, metal, massive front. Um, one from recent aluminum 
not so big, not such a big hood. So the question is, which of these cars would you rather be in in an accent like that? So what do y'all think? The old car with all that metal, the new car with all that aluminum and plastic. No airbag, obviously, in the Malibu. Although you could you could put an airbag in it if you wanted to, right? What and a seatbelt. So what? Where would you rather be in this accident? The newer one. Yeah, I mean, you kind of can guess, right? That's where we're going here. But how much is it? So that's the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety's front crash: the 2009 Chevrolet Malibu and 1959 Chevrolet Bel Air. And the question I might ask: Would a 2022 look different than a 2009? That's that's a good topic. How are cars changing? Obviously, you know, we, we got a lot of stuff added to cars in the last 13 years. Slow motion. You can see the differences in how the new and classic cars perform in this version of the traditional front. The key is to watch that dummy's head. Nothing personal. Watch that dummy's head and just especially the the driver, the steering wheel. Okay, so pay attention to that because and imagine that it's your head oh, because this is what you're driving. Watch his head. To commemorate his 50th anniversary, it dramatically shows Ooh. how much improvement has been made. But you want that to be your head. You're you're essentially dead, aren't you, in that situation? Yeah. I mean, or at least major, major trauma. Huh? I don't know if they tell you. This is probably 40. Where the Malibu front was on absorbed much of the crash course to the head of the windshield, the Bel Air structure allows the wider car to compress the passenger compartment. The impact yeah, so that's the key. It's great to have a lot of space, but if that space is so solid that you end up with an engine in your lap, it's that's not the space is not helping you. It's made worse for the Bel Air drivers due to lack of airbags, head restraints, and even a seatbelt. As a result, injuries to the neck, chest, and both legs would be likely. Consequently, the failure received a. Did you see his what his head did? A lot better. He he survived, right? He's alive. Now we're not seeing the feet. The feet are very very important as well, um, and much worse in this car. Much much worse in this car than the. Four ratings across the board. On the other hand, watch yeah, watch his head. good protection. You can even watch his feet. Well controlled. Measures indicate a low risk his, of his, body region. His feet hardly would be hardly even moved. Beyond the safety gear, advancements in vehicle engineering give the Malibu a clear advantage in this matchup. While classic cars are often considered to be rock solid, this 59 demonstrates how much better today's cars are. And the IHS has played a key role in driving these advancements. The past 50 years, the Institute has made a real impact. Roads today are safer for it. For complete safety information. Yeah, so it's thank goodness, right? I mean, that's people back in the 50s were now remember the guy's name who did the seatbelts. Um, if you want to do a, a history of car safety, Ralph Nader's, y'all know him. There it is right there. So y'all y'all know Ralph Nader? I mean, not personally. He's still alive, isn't he? I think. 1934, I can't do the math, 70, 80, 90, so he's like 88, 90. So he's he's the guy who ran against Al Gore, and he got just enough votes that Gore lost Florida. So pretty important. There's a lot of people who hate him for that. Um, but interesting guy. He's very much a consumer advocate kind of guy, plus a lot of other things. But he... He very long time ago. I mean, this must have been the fifties or sixties. But um, he he was advocating for seat belts. Um, the publication "Unsafe at Any Speed" in nineteen sixty five. So um, why this was a big issue for him? Nineteen fifty nine. So um, he pushed for that. So seat belts. It's kind of like if you look at the history of car safety, it was seat belts and then nothing forever and ever and ever. And then finally airbags. So it's like we want seat belts were enough. Have y'all seen child safety? Back in the 50s. They're kind of scary pictures, aren't they? 
y'all seen these things? I don't know if let me, you won't let me. I mean, my word, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's the kid would probably be safer if they weren't in the child's safety seat because it's just going to rip their stomach out. Um, so we've, there's, there's, that's been an investment probably before airbags where we really started doing that. So it's an interesting topic that the insurance industry, along with, remember not, the Institute of Highway Safety is, is a part of the insurance industry, has radically changed how we look at cars um, from a safety standpoint. Um, so here's their, their YouTube channel, this IIHS. Um, let me, I want to show you one, this is the last thing I'll show you. So we'll stop after Today this. we are releasing our initial list of 2023 top safety pick winners. We have 28 models that qualify for our top safety pick plus award and 20 more that met our criteria for our top safety pick award. Our top safety picks help consumers choose new vehicles that are standouts in the fleet when it comes to preventing a crash using vehicle technology and protecting occupants in the event that there is a crash. The big changes in our award criteria for 2023 include the need to protect occupants well in our updated site crash tests, prevent collisions with pedestrians at night, and provide effective headlights on all trim levels for a specific model. Original site crash tests were extremely successful in driving down the number of fatalities at these types of crashes. However, almost a quarter of our passenger vehicle fatalities still occur in these types of collisions. We need automakers to improve the safety of their vehicles to address today's site crashes, which are so that's that's what we want people doing is what where, what what are the accidents causing the deaths? Was it from the side? Was it an angle? Just real real precise, exactly what you know having a list and then addressing that. I mean, I'm glad we have people like that. That's all they do their whole life is if we make a car 0.1 percent safer. Yeah, that's great. Plus higher speeds and often involve striking vehicles that are short, such as pickups and SUVs. Pedestrian fatalities in the United States continue to be a large part of our road safety challenge. Since 2009, pedestrian deaths have risen by almost 80%. Vehicle technology that can detect and respond to pedestrians can be part of the solution to help address this crisis. Toyota Motor Corporation was our big winner. Now, was that the lights on the car and the driver stopped, or was that the car stopping? It's hard to tell from that video. Yep, can y'all tell from there? This year, with 15 total awards. This includes the brands of Toyota and Lexus. They had nine top safety pick plus winners and six top safety pick winners. Automakers deserve credit for achievements they've made in vehicle safety that have allowed us to drop three criteria from our 2023 awards. Virtually all tests we conduct with respect to roof strength and head restraints now get a good rating. In addition to that, vehicle to vehicle front crash prevention systems are standard equipment on almost all vehicles sold in the US marketplace as a result of an agreement that IAHS brokered back in 2016. While the list of winners is smaller than it was at this time last year, we expect the automakers will respond to our new criteria and updated evaluations, and we will be adding more models as we go throughout 2023. Yeah, so that's what they do, interesting stuff. Um, so if you're buying a new car, you might think about using them as, as a criteria, you know, as a, as a source. Uh, I, I, I finally remember the, uh, the car manufacturer. So, my lifetime, it was always Volvo. And that may not be true anymore because none of y'all thought of Volvo, but for my whole life, Volvo was the safest car. They were, I thought they were the ugliest cars. You might have one, that's fine. I just, I'm not good, I don't have great taste in cars. I just thought they're ugly cars, but you'd say some, someone would say, yeah, it's not a great car, but boy, they're safe. And that was always, now, did they deserve that reputation? They, they didn't mention Volvo, did they? They said Toyota and somebody else. Uh, but how does a car company get that reputation at least for a few decades there? You know, it's gonna come out in the numbers and what exactly were they doing that the others weren't doing and how did the others catch up if, if they no longer have that? All right, everybody's good for the exam Monday. If you have questions, you can call me. I'm on a bike a lot of times, so just call and I can help you through. All right.